Ukraine's embassy to Jerusalem in July. That's fantastic. That's a big thing. That's a very big statement. And we appreciate that very much. It's taken tremendous bravery by the president of Serbia and the president of Kosovo, who are with me today, two highly respected people this month. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. This is a huge day for us. It is the first day of our daily show, which is sort of daily. Uh, we are going to be on Tuesday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Eastern. A uh, huge achievement, and it's really thanks to you guys, our patrons especially. Special shout out to everybody who has contributed to the show to make it work patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. But it's also a big day because it is the first day after Labor Day. We are 58 days until November 3rd, which we can still call election day if you like, but actually it is the end of election period in America, which you know is already underway. You can ask for your mail-in ballot right now. Early voting is already happening in some state states and it's starting as early as next week in states like Pennsylvania. So here's our news. This is a big day for us because we are now four days a week, every weekday except Mondays, as you know, right after the majority part report, which is driving the progressive conversation. And I want to have a progressive conversation with you guys. Uh, I hope you all had a lovely Labor Day full of sun and solidarity. Mine was full, full of righteous anger. I, I, I'm pissed right now. I have to say it. I am extremely upset at our leadership. People are going hungry. They're forced to work in schools right now, inside. They're sending their children to schools for meals. Folks are being tossed out of their homes, evicted, or they can no longer afford them, and they don't want to resign their leases, and so they're leaving. Millions of people are out of work. Police violence continues to be out of control, and of course, so is COVID. But what are our progressive champions doing? Where are our progressive mayors, our progressive governors, progressive, and legislators? The people who we picked to rep represent us to carry our message. What are they doing? That is exactly what I want to know right now. Why is it that the moratorium on evictions is coming from Donald Trump? Why is one of the clearest statements on how inequality kills coming from a Trump-appointed chairman of the Federal Reserve. Over my Labor Day weekend, I could not stop thinking about Labor Day, about the meaning of Labor Day and the achievements of progressives over the last 120 years. All the accomplishments, protections for workers, rights to organize, better, if definitely not perfect, healthcare, services and support for those in need. And all of that progress grew out of post past calamity much of it was invented here in New York City and out of other great cities. It took unions and community organizers, immigrants, wealthier allies, 
what did they have that we can't seem to muster right now? Why can't we rise to this moment the way they rose to their moment? How do we bring back those days of unity? What the F is it going to take for Mayor Bill de Blasio to step up and do anything? Just pick something, an example, do something, recognize the crisis in the largest city in the country. I need to rein myself in because I have my breaks and furniture here in my home studio. But seriously, seriously, Trump loves to point out that American cities are controlled by Democrats, which is true. So why don't the Democrats do something? Even if it's just to beat Trump, they're all Democrats. What do they have to lose? Is it the campaign contributions from real estate developers or the hedge fund managers or police unions? Seriously, what is it going to take to get mayors and city council members and legislators to see that this is a radical moment that calls for radical actions. Why are you guys asleep at the wheel? Or were they ever really awake? It is one thing for Nancy, Nancy Pelosi, one of the richest members of the house to seem out of touch. But what is holding us back here in New York or Chicago or LA or Boston or San Francisco? People need help right now. You don't believe me? Listen to the nation's chief banker, a former investment banker, a Trump appointee you know, nonetheless, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell. Dorsey, can we roll that clip? Has the pandemic driven inequality? Yes, absolutely. Well, I would put it this way. The burdens of the pandemic have fallen um, to a greater extent on people at the low end of the income spectrum. And that's uh, that's people who worked in uh, in the service industry in relatively low paid jobs, dealing with the public, for example, in restaurants, in bars, in hotels, in airlines, in entertainment. Those people have tended to be, you know, have lower wages, be more skewed to minorities and, and more skewed to women. And so I would say without question, this event has exacer exacerbated really pre-existing disparities in our economy that were already troubling. Has the pandemic. So Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, is recognizing that there's income disparity that is caused by the neglect of our government responding to these crises. If this isn't head spinning enough, there was Donald Trump pledging to protect Americans from eviction. Maybe he did it because there's evictions on the rise in red states like Texas. But I'd like to know why the progressives in blue states aren't stepping up. Where are the bills in the legislature? I'm waiting. And don't tell me it's because you can't break with the machine. There have always been political machines in this country. Even Ed Koch made a pact, former mayor of New York, made a pact with the Queens and Brooklyn machines to become mayor of New York. He still managed to put through one of the most progressive expansions of affordable housing in New York City's history. He was not progressive. He was not perfect, but he still did it. We need that again. Plus healthcare, plus jobs, plus uh, increased minimum wage, plus free education and, and, and elimination of debt and training. Maybe you should fund the subways while you're at it. One more thing, we want to keep you up to date on the most important writing and thinking that's out there right now. And of all people, uh, here is an article that you have to check out in the American Prospect. It's by Stan Greenberg, Greenberg who's a pollster. He vividly describes his polling and Zoom focus groups among white working Americans. Many of them have had it with Donald Trump. They can't afford his divisiveness and his distraction. They are suffering and their biggest concern, what a shock, is healthcare. They need it and they thought in 2016 that Trump would get it for them. But now they are saying that they're disillusioned with Trump. So Biden has an opportunity here to win over these folks again with a clear promise that he will address this healthcare crisis. So check out Stan Greenberg and the American Prospect. It's a very interesting article. Uh, nothing that we didn't all know, but it just reinforces the narrative that Medicare for all was the issue that we needed to lead on. And it's the most important issue coming out of COVID. But I don't wanna keep you watching. We have a really great show today. Uh, we have two of the country's most effective president, effective progressive state legislators, uh, Representative Chris Rabb from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts Representative Mike Conley who maybe they can perhaps tell us how to organize in this moment and turn this moment into action because they're actually leading on the ground and in the legislature. 
But first up, we have Chris E. Brown. We are going to speak uh, about his expertise on policing and policing using force, because Trump, of course, wants law and order to be a top issue in this campaign. Uh, we want to get beyond that politics. We want to make sure that this is about police accountability. Uh, so we're going to talk to Chris E. Brown right after the break. But first, before we go, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe, join the chat, uh, get engaged, share this on social media. This is how this show is going to grow, uh, continue to build out. And we are, are really excited to, to go daily. So thank you to all of you. And if you have uh, the ability to do so, please join us on patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show for as low as $5 a month. Next up, we have Chris E. Brown. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, we're very excited to have our first guest of the new Daily Show, a lawyer, Christopher E. Brown. He runs the historic African-American law firm, The Brown Firm. He recently won a $3.5 million settlement for the family of Wayne Jones, a mentally ill man who was shot 22 times by West Virginia police. Uh, he was stopped simply for walking in the road rather than the sidewalk. The Jones case is a rare example where an attempt uh, by defense to say police had, quote, qualified immunity. Where have we heard that before? Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, these cases are horrific and, 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 and what's happening across this country and the fact that we need to settle on a legal system to be able to fight off what should be, you know, the accountability that should be happening in our legislatures right now. Um, and with our mayors and our city council members and overseeing the police unions. So I just, you know, thank you for your work and for coming on the show. This is, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to talk to somebody who's, who's in the mix. Oh, you're on mute. I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much. Is oh, it Zoom. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about like qualified Im immunity because this is a term that is being used. It's in the media. Um, but just as a refresher to folks, what does this term mean? Uh, it, essentially what it means is uh, it's a get out of jail free card for police officers who engage in the use of excessive force. So when Congress enacted, first of all, the Civil Rights Act in 1871 called the Ku Klux Klan Act and codified it in 42 USC section 1983, uh, essentially the Supreme Court came out and said, well, you know, you kind of must have meant that there should be some form of immunity for government actors. You can't just let them be exposed to lawsuits. And they sort of imposed this doctrine on this statute, with, which allows you to sue a state actor for violating your, your, your constitutional rights. Simple as that. And, and of course, it's being uh, taken advantage of in the highest degree right now. Why do you think that despite all of these cases being brought forward with camera footage, with public outrage, with the largest uprising in history, there's no action to eliminate, like real action happening um, to eliminate qualified immunity? Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, uh, like Will Smith said, it's not getting worse, <clears throat> it's being recorded. Right. And uh, the outcry across the entire world has been overwhelming for me to see it happening. 
and it gives me some hope that there will be some change. Now, some things are happening. Uh, you know, states can uh, remove qualified immunity from their state laws, and Maryland did that. Uh, Colorado just recently did that. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has introduced a bill. Uh, Representative, I think it's Presley and Amosh is his name. Yeah, have introduced another bill. Those have a long way to go. And in the end, though, qualified immunity, I don't think, I don't feel is really the culprit. The culprit is the way the courts are expanding the way it's applied to these cases. Mm -hmm. So when you have this two-prong test, the first prong is, did the officer violate the person's constitutional rights? Simple enough. And the second test is, was that right clearly established? And the way that that has been driven into the ground is that there is not a prior case that involves essentially the same facts. Uh, it will be found that the right was not clearly established and the officer is entitled to qualified immunity, even if it's accepted they violated his right, the person's rights. And, you know, it creates a real problem where you treat these officers like, like third graders, like they wouldn't know better. Uh, that violating the doing taking some sort of action would have violated somebody's rights and so well this since this ha hasn't happened before in this specific set of facts they're not we're going to grant them qualified immunity and they can't be sued the, the officers themselves can't be sued can the police unions can be sued uh th that's a different claim it's called a monel liability claim and for that claim to be brought against the municipality the police mm -hmm. department you have to show that the municipality had a policy that essentially resulted in the constitutional violation, which is an uphill battle. So whatever their policy was, uh, it essentially called for the behavior that the officers engaged in, which you can get at times, you know. Uh, choke holds, right? A lot of changes to choke holds and things like that. Uh, but it's a, difficult, it's a difficult hurdle to overcome. So when you're looking at these cases right now, um, what is the, the, the biggest, I guess, pattern of, excusable behavior by cops? Is it, and New York chokeholds are a big conversation, but getting shot 22 times in the back. Uh, the, the biggest problem, it always comes down to one thing. And that is the officer's uh, relatively simple ability to say, I was in fear for my own safety or the safety of other officers or members of the public. Mm -hmm. So this allows an officer, for example, to shoot a suspect in the back who's running away if he can provide some reasonable basis that I was scared they might run off and escape and then injure somebody else. And all too often in these cases, of course, the victim is deceased. Mm -hmm. So you have one person telling the story and he who, he who controls the story controls the facts. And you're dealing with this officer's sort of self-interested pers self perspective on how things occurred in order to establish this claim that you know I, I was in fear for my safety. And it's so broad the way it's applied because there's such a hesitancy to second guess officers' reactions that you know we really sort of lay down and say, well, you know, if he said he was afraid, then you know, we don't want officers out here not acting because they're scared they're gonna get sued, which has created this uh, enormous blanket of protection for police officers. Um, I, I want to ask you more about the protection that the that the unions put out there and, and, and how they're protected even after they they're caught, uh, you know, whether it's violating law or, 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 you know, more minor stuff. But does the officer actually have to express, I am scared? Or is there something that they have to verbally state to show and prove? I think this has come up a lot where officers have said, I was scared. And then you see the footage and it's like, it doesn't seem like you were scared. Yeah. So this is where we talk about there being a reasonable basis for their fear. <clears throat> so essentially this has become sort of the, uh, what I refer to as the, uh, I smelled marijuana in the car of the police of the excessive force world. So, you know, if you get pulled over, if an officer says he smelled marijuana, he can search your car, search you, take you out, do anything he wants. And you can never really disprove that. Right. This is the problem. And similarly, in excessive force cases, you see sort of these catchphrases. Um, you know, I have another case uh, pending in the Fourth Circuit right now where the officer said uh, he was running with his hands in his pockets. And they gave the argument they made was they gave us a reasonable belief that he was holding a firearm. And that's why we shot him while he was jumping over the fence. I mean, you know, sometimes it makes you ask yourself, like, how how could that right not be clearly established? But yet again and again and again they are granted this defense. 
the police unions is a big, big deal. Uh, the power they have and really where that comes, the problem arises from the disciplinary process. So anytime officers have complaints against them or engage in an officer shooting, they go through this incredibly cumbersome process that's really built up by the police unions, which takes an enormous amount of time. And the, the officers really, what you find is they end up jumping departments. So they'll leave and go to a, a sheriff's office, go to a different police department. And that police department doesn't want to, you know, waste resources and continuing examination and, and investigation. So it stops and you have these officers who are jumping around who really have no record of having engaged in the use of excessive force in the past. So there's literally nothing on the record when they go to a new union or new, excuse me, a new uh, police department. There's no, there's no backlog. There's no, okay, well, we're aware that, that, there, that he was at least moved here because of that. The, ex but, everything, everything just, it's a clean slate. Well, the unions make these due process arguments like we would out here as the public and say, look, there was no final determination. So you can't put that on his record. So you switch over, you've got no record, whatever investigations were going on, that former department has no interest in continuing it. And you, you jump ship, go to a sheriff's office in the local county, a nearby county, and you, you keep, keep on keeping on. Fascinating. And okay, in terms of cities though, uh, you're seeing a tremendous amount of pressure put on mayors, city council members, and legislators, as you mentioned, to do something. What can be done? because it, 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 they've clearly manipulated law to the fullest extent to be able to protect themselves. Um, is there any sort of opening right now that you see with there existing is. laws? With existing well, I'll tell you this, cases? there was a huge opening that the Supreme Court passed on recently where they had about what, nine cases on cert before them on qualified immunity and they chose not to take them on. Now, normally you might chalk that up to them passing the buck to Congress. Well, look, they control the laws, they write the laws, let them deal with it. But that's not the case here. Now, this is a, a judicially created doctrine. And the courts are the ones who have to, who have to address it unless Congress is going to come out and ne negate it altogether by clearly stating this, there is no immunity with respect to a 1983 claim. But you know, the chance of them doing that, you know, I was listening to your, uh, your live show before I got on. I mean, this is a problem, right? Congress is not going to act. We have to get money out of politics. Uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done. Now, what can we effectively do? Uh, get on the ground, get your groups together. There's a, there's a women's group, there's a, a Middle Eastern group, there's an Asian group, there's an African American group. These groups have got to begin to join forces, put pressure on their political leaders, put their support behind local leaders and start to go up the chain. And we have to start uh, putting better people in government. Government is not inherently bad. It's the people in government who have interests that do not align with that of the people they're supposed to be representing. I mean, it seems simple enough, but, but that's what's been going. I mean, you have a massive movement like this. It's, it's, I think it's, it was horrifying as it just feels like there's a stall. There's a stall in places like New York where there's really no excuse for a progressive mayor or a progressive city council not to take action uh, or even a legislature to take action. I mean, they're, they're, they don't start session until January. I mean, in the meantime, how many people are going to get murdered? How many people will be facing their own legal challenges and, and trying to get through and, and nothing happens? Um, yeah, and look, I'm hopeful to think that while you, you know, protests are still going on in Portland and other cities. Yeah. Uh, they were going on you know, tens of thousands of people around the world after George Floyd was killed. You have to think we could capitalize on that momentum in this movement. But yet it's, it's similar to what the police unions do with the disciplinary process. It gets dragged out, it gets drawn out. These cases take years. The Wayne Jones case that I settled a month ago, he was shot in 2013, hmm. like six years we litigated that case, three, three trips to the court of appeals. So it's gonna be tough. Uh, the same thing is gonna happen here. You, you see the lawyers out for George Floyd and for uh, the, the, the recent guy, Mr. Blake in Wisconsin, and they're all on the news. They can say what they want. It's not going, that, that case is not gonna resolve anytime soon. They're gonna fight it. They fight it hard. Blake's case is gonna be very tough. Why he's that? reaching into his car. This is a great example of how easy to come up with that reasonable belief is. They're gonna say, I don't know what he was reaching for. He could have been reaching for a gun. And courts are loath to second guess that. And yet they won't take the approach that you're approaching this man at a 
some kind of birthday party or something at a family house. And why are you chasing him and run, running him down with guns in your hands? What's the, what's the urgency? You know where these people live. You know where they are. And there's always this sort of uh, sense of urgency to, to chase people down and pull their guns out on them and, and make them get on the ground and on your knees and we're going to pat you down. I mean, the same thing happened to Wayne Jones. It's, a, it's sad to think you could be walking next to the sidewalk and that is your violation in violation of a city ordinance and you could be dead 20 minutes later. I mean, it's frightening. And yet that's what happened. The officer walked up and said, hey, what are you doing? And Mr. Jones properly said, I didn't do anything. Why are you bothering me? I didn't do anything. And the officer asked him, well, do you have any weapons on you? And he says, I might have something on me. He tells him, put your hands on the car. Why? Nothing, nothing illegal about having a knife on you. Nothing illegal about having a gun on you, if you have a permit for it. And yet this man was doing nothing wrong. And he's required to put his hands on the car. And he, he, he doesn't want to do it. So they start to struggle. And he tases the man. And he ends up dead. And we've got to have a better means of approaching uh, how we address certain situations in our community, which is why the defund the police issue is important. And there's a lot of misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important to note that we have a wonderful network of social workers, for example, in this country, who love and care about their communities, know the people in their communities. And a lot of that funding that goes towards the militarization of the police can go towards, at a much lower expense, funding these social workers to respond to some of the simpler calls that are involved, like domestic violence issues, uh, issues with children in neighborhoods or in a school, or a fight over a parking space at a 7-Eleven. Yeah. Like we, you know, I heard a sheriff say it once, our problem is no matter what the issue, we send a guy with a gun. Right. We, ha we have to change it. Well, and even just if, if the whole assumption is, well, I felt fear and it was based on some sort of, re and their excuses, he reached for something. Let's just start from the premise of the power is in the, the hands of the men with the gun approaching the vehicle. In what reasonable sense would anybody, even if there was a gun, go to grab a gun in the face of an officer? How often is that going to happen anyways? So it's, it's just the whole script. It, it, everything is is approached from this lens of the power, the people who are actually in power in that moment are the victims or the potential victims or feeling like the victims rather than the people who are likely unarmed, more likely to be unarmed in these situations. And even if they do have, it's, it doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're defending themselves from the police. It's, I just think the whole notion is, it's, it's, it's spitting in the face of our justice system and, and what we're supposed to stand for, asking questions first. And I'm sure, you know, you deal with this every day, so I'm just preaching to you. Um, but as a, as I think this is what public citizens are feeling now for the first time ever watching these videos and you're, you're in, in the trenches fighting this every day. So. Well, those, um, those, those concerns speak to uh, the inherent centuries old stereotype about angry, violent black men. Exactly. You know, this is why you don't see this when you have Caucasian persons walking down the street with guns and, you know, no one, no one seems to care. And yet uh, a black man reaches into his car and you thought he was going to have a gun and shoot and kill you. So you killed him and shot him six times in the back. You know, it's a, it's a problem. It's a major problem. Um, are you working on anything right now that we should be aware of? Uh, with the case I have, Minifield versus the city of Winchester in Virginia was a really interesting case where he was running with his hands in his pockets, supposedly. Uh, they were in the neighborhood looking for a guy at a, with a gun in a fight, and they knew who the guy was. They, they, they were looking for him, pulled his brother over. My guy's walking with the brother and takes off. They want to chase my guy for some reason. And they say he stumbled and fell on the ground and pulled out a handgun and shot himself in the back of the head and killed himself. In the back of course, of I, we have three. Yeah, not not in the temple, not in here, in the back of the head. And I have three witnesses who say, uh, no, he was running. He went to jump a fence. We heard a gun go off. He slumped over the fence like he was dead. And five officers ran up to pull him off the fence and slam him on the ground. And then they kept everybody away, you know, and, and protected this scene. And a number of things take place. Uh, they found a gun. Uh, they call it in 30 minutes later. Oh, we for forgot to call in the gun we recovered. Mm -hmm. 
So it's an interesting case. And I, I'll give the court credit. It's in the Western District of Virginia. The court denied the officer qualified immunity. Hmm. And the officers have another arrow in their quiver. They're allowed an interlocutory appeal on that issue, meaning they don't have to wait till after trial. And the officer appealed it. And that one's in the Fourth Circuit right now. And we should get an opinion here in any, any week, in a, in a month or two. You're really doing um, the right work right now because this is, I mean, it just seems very hopeless. As are you. Thank you. We can just amplify you as much as possible. Uh, Christy Brown, thank you very much for, for sharing your expertise with us. I think a lot of people are just very curious about how this process works and um, grateful to you and your work. Thank you so much. Up next, we have a panel uh, with two of the most progressive legislators in this country. Uh, we're going to talk about the eviction moratorium and some of the news items of the day. Stick around. We have Representative Rab and Representative Conley up next. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show, home edition for this week. Uh, <laughs> excited to have on our first panel of our daily show, uh, we are doing a fun panel with highlighting some progressive uh, legislators. I think there's a little bit of feedback on one of your, your ends if you guys have the show up. Uh, it's like the call-ins from the radio and the radio is on in the background and you're hearing with the call-in, <laughs> same situation. Uh, we have Representative Chris Rabb, who is back again from Pennsylvania's 100th District, and a new guest on the show is Representative Mike Conley, who uh, is a, a DSA member. I remember when you got elected. I was so excited in 2016. So it's great to see you guys in office. Uh, Rep. Rabb, you've always, you know, you've been fighting for a long time. Um, so thanks for joining the show. My pleasure. Great to be back on. So uh, Thank you for having us. Representative Conley, I just want to start with you because this news is hot and you're in Massachusetts. Uh, how do you feel about Markey? Like, let's let's talk about the energy on the ground there. You know, it, it was a real triumph, I think, for progressives and for people on the left. It, it would have been incomprehensible if the co-author of the Green New Deal were to be defeated in his primary. So I was really grateful of the movement that stood up to defend uh, Senator Markey. And so much of the movement, um, I think we knew it, but he credited the like the young people who are organizing online, the Sunrise uh, kids calling, making calls while they're home. Uh, you know, everyone's home right now. Um, I find it interesting because this is just what, what we would normally look at as grassroots politics, but because the Democratic Party has been lacking so much organizing to see the left find its own way uh, to win was, was very inspirational. Rep. Rab, you're known for turning out the highest uh, level of votes, right? Is that, is that accurate? In yes. Pennsylvania. What's yes. the secret? Uh, 
Well, I inherited an amazing district. So, you know, some of it is this causation and correlation at okay. the same time. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it's being engaged. Um, it's finding new ways to connect uh, with stakeholders, neighbors, voters and constituents. Um, it's, it's shaking things up and also having an authentic and substantive message. Um, and people are tired of the same old, same old, irrespective of political affiliation. So I'm in a city where the vast majority of voters are Democrats, but in Northeast Philly, we got a lot of folks who are Trump loving Democrats. And in my part of the district, uh, my part of the city, um, it's far more left and they're all Democrats. So what does it mean to be a Democrat? So I really lead with my values and I say unapologetically that I'm a progressive and I'll work with anyone who wants to move the ball forward. You mentioned previously that you had a very popular but certainly not progressive New York mayor who did things that had a progressive impact by building bridges. That's what public servants are supposed to do. I need 102 votes to pass anything in the House of Representatives and there's only a handful of uh, you know, uh, progressives amongst us. So that means we have to build bridges with other folks issue by issue by issue. And that's, that's really the job of a, of a true uh, elected official who seeks to legislate um, to make things better. Let's get into this a little bit because um, the theme of this show is really what's wrong with what's wrong with this moment. Why are leaders not rising to the occasion? I, you know, in the last 120 years, I mean, the, even since the Great Depression, we really can't. Is is there a moment that's comparable? No, and it's like lawmakers are asleep at the wheel. You two are not asleep at the wheel, but you have to work in state capitals where folks seem to be asleep at the wheel. Um, Representative Conley, you're in Massachusetts, a supposedly extremely progressive state. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania is not far behind, but but what is it like right now trying to push through crisis legislation that deals with this crisis, Let, even the eviction crisis? We'll start with that. Uh, well, on the eviction front, you know, we've had a lot of success. We were able to introduce uh, what's been called one of the strongest eviction moratoriums in the nation and pass it into law. Uh, but, you know, there's still a lot to be desired in our state, as in so many places. And, you know, one of the troubling things for us as progressives, for example, is someone like Governor Baker has you know, on any given day, 80% of Democrats approve of the job he's doing. Um, and he is not a Democrat. Let's remind people. Exactly. He's a Republican. And, you know, he has been um, not really a friend of, of, uh, of a lot of the causes that we care about. So, you know, I think it's, it's really about building the movements and building those narratives that can actually inspire people uh, to move forward, bringing it back to the start of this conversation, the way, you know, Senator Markey partnered with Representative Ocasio-Cortez and partnered with the Sunrise Movement, it really created a model to show that when we own our own narrative and when we invite people in, we can overcome uh, a lot of that conservative and moderate resistance to our agenda. Um, I, I want to piggyback on something Representative said uh, that's so important. Um, when we control the narrative. The reason I love uh, coming on your show and shows like it is you are part of independent media. You're not corporate owned. Um, we need more independent voices to shine the light on all the things that the establishment seeks to hide, either through the legislative process or what have you. And so these are forms of community wealth. One of the key forms of community wealth that I know you, we all care about is shelter, is our homes, whether we're renters or homeowners. Um, if we have stable homes, we have a stable society. And we pick winners and losers all the time as legislators, even though many folks on the right claim to not do so, they say they want the market to do so. But one of the biggest tax benefits um, homeowners get is the, the uh, home mortgage uh, uh, tax deduction, right? It's uh, the mortgage interest tax deduction. It's huge. Um, and a lot of people rely on that. We don't provide similar benefits to renters. What about long-term renters who can't or do not want to own a home? What kind of protections do they have? So our values are baked into the legislative process and the statutes on the, on the state and federal level that we don't 
reinvestigate and say, maybe we need to dust off the cobwebs here and do something that's far more equitable. And we can do that around policing. We can do that around labor issues, environmental issues, but certainly as it relates to housing, we have the largest full-time state legislature in the country. There's 256 of us, uh, 253, excuse me, 253. And we have no committee on housing. What? <laughs> Are you kidding? There is no standing committee on housing. It was, it was one of the first things I asked By when time. I got elected, but I would think so. Um, there are things, there are different committees that address different aspects of housing, but nothing directly, which blows me away. It, it is indicative of how far behind we are. And the last thing is you said people are asleep at the wheel. Well, the representative and I, uh, I don't know if progressives control your state legislature, but they sure as heck don't control mine. And so the people are asleep at the wheel. We're trying to push them out the way so we can grab it before we you know, run off the road here. Um, it's not like we all have our own steering wheel. So we have to work together and that's challenging. But one of the things that, that I am so inspired by is all of these mass protests and all this creativity around uh, dissent and resistance and reimagining our institutions has inspired a, a subset, a critical subset of legislators in Pennsylvania and around the country for us to do our jobs better and more creatively. And that is a powerful statement for young people who are not even old enough to, to drive a car or, or vote. So on that note, I mean, there are some Democrats that probably lean more progressive, but maybe, I mean, both of you have come from states where there's some semblance of a quote unquote machine. Um, maybe they come out of the machine, maybe they feel beholden to to certain interests, whether it's financial interests or political interests. And it, I mean, from my perspective as a New Yorker, it seems like that's always what is stopping the progress. I mean, we have a city council that is supposedly the most progressive city council in the country, and yet all of them take real estate money. All of them, literally every single one of them takes real estate developer money. And you wonder why nothing's happening in this city. What are the dynamics in your states? I'll go with my uh, Representative Conley. Um. Well, you know, we do have a, a super majority of Democrats in the in our House and in our Senate, but you know, Stop again, bragging. I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but we again, we do have the Republican governor, and you know, it's always a struggle. You can't uh, take anything for granted. So, for example, uh, two years ago, we had a question on the ballot ballot question should we have safe staffing limits for nurses? And the voters rejected that. You know, the uh, hospitals and the insurance companies put tens of millions of dollars in a campaign and scared people into voting against uh, safe staffing limits. And so, you know, uh, it's a challenge with the numbers, but it's always a challenge with that narrative building and being able to show people um, this is how this proposal will help you. And, and certainly, you know, credit to you, Nomiki, uh, because having media that will prioritize and sort of center the stories of people who are, you know, most in need is so important. You know, I think one of the reasons why we're not seeing great housing legislation is, you know, CNN and MSNBC, uh, they're, they're talking about whatever stupid thing Donald Trump said and they spend all their time talking about that until he says something stupid tomorrow, and then they're talking about that. Um, so the more we can focus on people experiencing homelessness, people who have been caught up in this criminal justice system, uh, the easier I think it'll be to pass progressive legislation. Representative Rapp? Uh In Pennsylvania, if you're a lobbyist, Nomi, you could buy me a Tesla. You could buy me a summer home and it would be perfectly legal. I don't I know what's buy, going on. In, you could buy, buy me something. Yeah. You could buy me something extravagant. And if, as long as I report it, it's okay. Transparency. But you can buy me stuff. You can wine and dine me. And if uh, you won the lottery, you could cut me a million dollar check to my campaign. There are no campaign contribution limits in Pennsylvania. Do you hear me, Rep? I don't know what's going well, on in Massachusetts, but it is yeah. nuts here in Pennsylvania. So if you're in, if you're in a senior position um, in the state legislature, 
and you can influence, so there's a perception that you can influence legislation. There's more entities who are cutting you checks, almost irrespective of, of your platform because you have access, you have influence. And so you get checks and that accumulates. And if you've been there, if there are no um, uh, uh, term limits either in Pennsylvania. So you can be there for a long time and just used to be getting checks all the time, regardless of where it comes from, you're like, whatever. Um, and that builds up over time and it, it ossifies. And it, it is truly a corrosive element to what we're doing. I have colleagues uh, who, who I respect, who um, I know are smart and know what the right side of an issue is, who sometimes vote the wrong way because there is even the perception that moneyed interests are gonna drop a ton of money on a challenger to be in their next election two years down the road. Or um, they will withhold large sums of money that they're used to getting. Um, because if they're in a lot, most legislative districts and there's 203 across Pennsylvania are non-competitive. So if you're an incumbent, you're there pretty much for as long as you like. And very few uh, people uh, have serious competition, which means that you don't need to raise a lot of money. And so the folks who you're going to get money from are the people who want to influence what you do in the legislature, legislature, which is why I always lead with, you want to know who controls Chris Rabb? Ask my mommy. My mom is one of my biggest campaign <laughs> contribution <laughs> contributors. And I, to just to make the point that it's really important that if I say I'm progressive and I'm independent minded, then my money should reflect that. I can't say that I'm independent minded and I have the same knuckleheads who are controlling the status quo, and I don't. And, but that is something that needs to be um, more influenced by legislation that, uh, that puts small donors at the table and in this, this long era of, of really legalized corruption and bribery. And, it's, and Pennsylvania is one of the worst states. So we have a lot of work to do. And it's possible that the Democrats are gonna take the House and the Senate um, uh, on November 3rd. We're hoping it does. But again, it, the other axis we're talking about is establishment or reformer, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if everyone is an establishment dem in power, that dynamic may not change significantly. So it just, just a quick follow-up. Has that always been the way in Pennsylvania or is this a, 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 a reform uh, that was brought to you by a lobbyist to be able to give these gifts? As far as I know, this is the norm. And we, we uh, expanded and professionalized our legislature in 1968. That's also the same year we uh, provided special privileges to uh, uh, Fraternal Order of Police. Uh, 1968 was a very special year where so many of those uh, um, deeply problematic um, statutes uh, were enacted out of fear. And a lot of that fear was because the black folks were organizing on the street and um, we're still paying for it 52 years later. Yeah. So as progressives in the legislature, um, you know, we saw this with Congress. We saw the squad get targeted. They, we saw millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars being thrown around to, to challenge them or really to tie up their money. I, I don't think anybody ever really thought that any of the squad members were gonna lose, or maybe they did, I don't know. Um, but it really sucked a lot of the resources away. And that's part, one of the threats that can be used against progressives who decide to buck the system, buck the party, buck the establishment, buck muddied interests and challenge them. Representative Donnelly, or, or, or Conley, excuse me, are you, <laughs> tongue twist, um, are you feeling that? Because you were elected as a DSA member in Massachusetts, which is, you know, like hedge fund right. capital. Yeah, I mean, you know, so far I've, I've been fortunate to have, you know, real uh, strong support from my district. So, you know, I wasn't challenged uh, this session, but uh, hopefully I, I think the, the constituents and the voters see me out there, you know, day in, day out doing the work and uh, representing our community. You know, I mean, another one of the challenges is sort of the, you know, the regional sort of differences insofar as I represent Cambridge and Somerville, incredibly progressive community. You know, I often say, if the whole state was Cambridge and Somerville, we'd be all set, you know, we'd be in great shape. 
But then once you get right beyond sort of the urban core, you start getting out into the suburbs. Um, that's an area where the most basic notion of police reform is met with very strong resistance. The most basic attempts at affordable housing uh, met with very strong resistance. And so um, certainly now, you know, I'm in my second term. So I'm starting to think, gee, you know, how can I help move the rest of the state along and get it to where we are, you know, here in Cambridge and Somerville? That, I, I, I was going to. I was going to uh, guess where you represent it based on your politics. And that was going to be my first guess. I actually have a, a great, great grandfather who was, who, who lived in, uh, in Cambridge and who's one of the first uh, city council members, uh, African-American oh, city wow. council members over a hundred years ago. So we'll have to talk. I got, yeah. I got a lot of history in, in, in Cambridge. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I represent the Cambridge of Philadelphia. Uh, my district is, um, uh, so blue. Uh, I, I told Bernie Sanders once. I said there, there are more um, uh, dissentist patriotic uh, uh, lawn signs than there are Republicans in my district. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I can I can relate. But this is my this is my tip to folks who want to reach beyond the bubble, and it's worked very well for me because um, you know, I'm, I'm pushing a state reparations bill. So it's not earning me a lot of friends outside of these blue bubbles, but people are often interested. They may assign certain motives to me because I'm black or progressive or this or that. Um, but if you engage them in, uh, in good faith and you anticipate all of their arguments, which is not hard, uh, because I'm 50 years old, I've been black a while, and I, I know most of the, I can anticipate most of the questions and assumptions. Eventually, you can uh, wear down people's defenses and have a real conversation. That doesn't mean you change them overnight, but if you just work on them incrementally and you find a way to connect their story, their narrative, and yours, it's vastly um, easier. And so most white people I talk to are white folk who've only been in this country two, three, maybe four generations. You know, my people have been here nine generations, right? So um, if I can connect a story they can relate to as the descendant of immigrants, and I can talk about my, my family history as descendants of enslaved laborers, that's a starting point that most people, have, that's a conversation most people have never had because so many people are afraid to talk about race explicitly because if white people talk about race, it must mean they're racist. That's absurd. So sometimes the, the thing to do is the most uh, counter, um, counterintuitive um, and seemingly bold, but it just makes sense. And I've found that I've built some interesting relationships with folks who do not share my politics when you reach out to them in good faith and you find something that, um, that uh, engages both of you. I mean, that's, that's, that was sort of Bernie Sanders' theory too, was I can be to the first left and still work with Republicans on on issues if you find a common bond. I think yep. the fear that is put out there is no one's ever gonna work with you if you're that far to the left. No one's ever going, it's not realistic. Not true. When, yeah. It's not, it is not true. I understand why people think that. And I was one of those people until it worked. And I don't have to hide my politics or my passion or my values. There is a way to do it. And uh, if I can give you one quick example, the last time I was on your show, um, I was talking about uh, bills that we are working on around police accountability and police violence. Well, after that show, we stormed uh, the, the House of Representatives, the floor, and we shut down the session for the first time in like 300 years. Amazing. And we got Republicans to push Democratic bills that had been languishing for well over a year. And we got five Democratic bills enacted into law within 40 days. The reason that happened was because young people on the streets demanded change and they inspired us. And we engaged in this institution uh, with respect, but with boldness and said, we're not going anywhere until legislators legislate. And they looked among the legislation and said, these are the ones we're most comfortable with. Obviously they're, they're bolder, more, uh, even more important things that we haven't gotten to that are gonna be more challenging, but we were able to do it and do it in good faith and substantively um, even though some of us uh, define ourselves as, as left, progressive, what have you, it is possible 
Um, it's being done. We need to replicate it and we need to share these, these winning stories with others so that they can do it and not believe that just because we are so far over here, we can't get anything done. Because the reality is the majority of America is actually behind us on so many progressive issues. And so many things that once were cons considered progressive are now mainstream. So we've moved on. So these are all good things. The fact that there are white people talking about white supremacy in mainstream society on cor in corporate media is mind blowing to me as a black person, mind blowing. We are able to have these conversations and mobilize people and get people and expand that, that mainstream to include those things that once were on the perilous left and it's becoming normalized. And that's a good thing. Or what you could do is you could get the activists to crowdsource a bunch of money and buy a Tesla and give it to the lawmakers that you need to sign on to your business. I feel like that's a little bit less effort. Just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> All right. Uh, from the Cambridge of Queens, Astoria, the most progressive uh, congressional district, at least, in the country. I, I thank you guys. <laughs> We're in our little socialist ecosystems uh, or bubbles, but... Thank you for your work. Um, we'd love to have you both back on to, to give us updates from the field. Because, you know, this is the other thing. Like, no one ever talks about just what, what is it like being in the legislature? Once you're elected, okay, we're getting all these folks elected. Now what? How do they, how do you survive? I imagine it's a maddening place uh, with that much yes. money being thrown around. So yes. thanks for keeping to your values and, and staying true um, despite all the pressure. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thank yes. you. All right, special shout out to Dermot Madden. Wow. Dropping the money, thank you. We were just talking about how I was gonna uh, pay for some technological updates. I think that might be it. So thank you, Dermot, really grateful uh, for your love on the show. And um, thank you to everybody for, for joining today for our first day. Again, we are going daily Tuesday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Tomorrow we're gonna have a great show. Um, uh, you wanna stay, is, is, you want to tune in every single day this week. We're going to have really amazing guests, uh, but definitely tune in on Friday if you can, because we're going to do a special on 9-11. So um, likely what we're going to do is have reoccurring panelists. So you'll get to know the panelists. You'll get to know uh, Rep Connolly. You'll get to know Rep Rab and hear what's happening on the ground. You'll get to know other guests that we have on the panels, and we'll talk about the issues of the day. And then uh, we'll do main interviews earlier in the show. So uh, we're going to try to keep this as informed as, as possible. We're going to experiment a little in the coming weeks. So, so just be patient with us. And um, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's really this kind of love like Dermot Madden gave us that gives us ability to do so. So uh, thank you to all of you. And check us out on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show. Make sure to smash that like button, share, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. That is how the show is going to grow. Uh, but on behalf of The Nomi Key Show, thank you. And we will see you tomorrow. 3 p.m. Eastern, right here.